Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the two little books of the Bible on Ezra and Nehemiah. This is lesson number six of that series for November 9 of 2019 entitled The Reading of the Word. Hmm. We'll see what all that implies as we study together, but let's begin as usual with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for the many experiences that are spelled out in the Word of God, in your Word. We thank you for the many stories and lessons we can learn from them. Now help us to learn what you want us to know from the experiences of Nehemiah and Ezra is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So for those of you who have a Bible handy, most of this particular lesson is going to be found in Nehemiah 8. So maybe you want to open to that chapter. These events happened when the leaders of the people rejoiced after they had completed the building of the wall, seeking God's guidance, continued guidance, and encouraging people to gather for the reading and understanding of God's word. So a lot of things were coming together. This was a momentous moment. As we have noted before, in Scripture there are numerous chiasms. Uh, chiasm is a word that uh, comes from Hebrew, no, it comes from Greek, the Greek word chi, which is like a giant X. Um, and it's a literary structure where the ideas form a large V or X with the most important point being in the middle. Look at the structure of Nehemiah 8. The book of the law is read, verses 1 and 2. People respond and worship the Lord, verses 3 through 6. They understand the reading, verses 7 and 8. The day is holy, do not mourn nor weep, they're instructed, verse 9. And then the key point, verse 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Then, going back again, this day is holy, do not be grieved, verses 11 and 12. Found in the reading that they should dwell in booths, verses 13 to 15. And then people responded, respond and make booths, 16 and 17, and Book of the Law read, 18. So you can see there's a kind of a V of whichever you want to call it there. So, how could the Israelites, I'm sorry, yeah, in Nehemiah's day, not be joyful and celebrating when they realized, one, the wall was completed for the first time in decades. Two, uh, the inhabitants of Jew Jerusalem were reasonably protected from foreign enemies. And three, even their enemies recognized that this was done by God. I wonder how often we get involved in some major project and we something happens that we just say, absolutely, this had to be God's doing. That, that would be pretty, pretty awesome, I think. Well, we know that the wall was completed during the month of Elul, the sixth month, Nehemiah 6.15 tells us that. So if you were the governor of Judea in those days and you had just succeeded in doing something that had not been possible for decades, what would you do? Well, Nehemiah 8-10 to 10 makes it clear that the entire nation were prepared to celebrate. And that is what they did. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what was involved in their celebration, what did they learn, how did they learn it, etc. And so, Dennis, I think you can get us started. Yes, Nehemiah 8.1. By the seventh month, the people of Israel were all settled in their towns. On the first day of that month, they all assembled in Jerusalem in the square just inside the water gate. They asked Ezra, the priest and scholar of the law, which the Lord had given uh, Israel through Moses, to get the book of the law. And that's from uh, the uh, Good News translation of the Holy Bible. Okay, so all you Hebrew scholars, the seventh month is about what time in, in our year? Depends on if you're going in the civil calendar or the religious calendar, doesn't it? Uh, this would be uh, their religious calendar. The when, do you know when the... Sometime in the fall. Yeah. September, oh, yeah. October... Yeah, in my uh, Good News Bible, it says on October 2, the wall okay. was finally finished. There you go. 
So the the events in this in this section will will come shortly after that. New Living Translation. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Jackie. I think. Oh, is that you? I think I, I I was going to continue. Okay, that. go ahead. I, I think we didn't see that there was a difference there, but this is from the adult. Uh, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide uh, for Sunday. The seventh month, the month of uh, Tishri, mm-hmm. Tishri, was perhaps the most important month for the Israelites as it was dedicated to the Feast of Trumpets, preparation for God's judgment, first day of the month, the Day of Atonement, Judgment Day, tenth day of the month, and the Feast of Tabernacles, remembering God's deliverance from Israel, from Egypt and his provision through the journey in the wilderness, 15th day of the month. The, so, ga- the, yeah, the gathering took place on the first day of the month on which the Feast of Trumpets was celebrated. So we're talking about a major, a major month of, of religious holiday, religious celebrations of various kinds. And they came and they said, right up front, we want the Word of God to be read to us. Now, why would that be necessary? Didn't they all have their pocket editions of the Bible? (laughs) (laughs) Sure they did. Left their cell phones and... (laughs) No, in those days, uh, documents had to be written on scrolls, a long rolled out thing, and they rolled, had to unroll one side and roll up the other side, so... when they were very expensive. And very expensive. As we've already noted in our studies, Ezra put, spent much of his time as a scholar of the scriptures, pulling together whatever copies of the scriptures that he could find among the people in order to establish what we now call the Old, Old Testament. He was the first one to put together those documents to say, he didn't call it the Old Testament, but he said, this is our inspired record. On this special Feast of Tabernacles Day, the people came together for the reading of God's word. Ezra chose to read from the Torah, which is the first five first books, first five books, the five Moses. books of Moses. Mm-hmm. What is interesting to note is that they, the people, asked Ezra to read to them from the book. So how did that take place? Jackie? Nehemiah 8, 2 and 3. So Ezra brought it to the place where the people had gathered, men, women, and the children, who were old enough to understand. There in the square, by the gate, he read the law to them from dawn until noon, and they all listened attentively. Wow. I just have one comment. Yes. The reason they wanted to have the scriptures read to them is they, it showed how they knew that God had done this work. Yeah. And now they wanted to know what he had to say. Very good. Appropriate. Well, and I, I, I'm not a mother, but the first thing that hits me when I read it, okay, so where were all the children who were too young to understand? Yeah, <laughs> that was my first thought too. <laughs> Somebody had to stay back. Yeah. 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 yeah, if you had been Ezra, considering what had just happened and the past several, seventy years of history, what would you have read? Well, the Target? yeah, they read Deuteronomy thirty-one. 9 to 13. So Moses wrote down God's law and gave it to the Levitical priests who were in charge of the Lord's covenant box and to the leaders of Israel. Now I'm going to interrupt for just a second. When did that happen? Anybody know the approximate date for Moses giving to the priests? 1460. 1461 or so. Yeah, this would be at the end of their wandering, so 1405, 1410, somewhere around in there. And what time are we talking about in Ezra reading reading this back now? Oh, this 40, is... 440, something like that. So yeah. basically a thousand years have gone by. A thousand yeah. years have gone by. Okay, go ahead. It's Thank you, It's amazing that, yeah. He commanded them at the end of every seven years when the year... When the year that debts are canceled come around, read this aloud at the Festival of Shelters. Read it to the people of Israel when they come to worship the Lord your God at the one place of worship. Call together all the men, women, and children 
and the foreigners who live in your town, so that everyone may hear it and learn to honor the Lord your God and obey his teachings faithfully. In this way, your descendants who have never heard the law of the Lord your God will hear it, and so they will learn to obey him as long as they live in the land that you are about to occupy across the Jordan. It's from the Good News Bible. Well, so, this happens just at the end of the 40 years in the wilderness yes. before they cross over. Yes. Okay. Deuteronomy. Not con- when Sinai happened. No, no, no. This is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy consists primarily of three sermons that Moses gave as they were camped uh, just on the other side of the Jordan River. It's in flood season. So in those days, the people weren't sucking water out of the Jordan. There was huge flood season. Uh, you can get, if you go back to the 1920s or something like that, I have pictures of the Jordan almost filling up the valley. It was sometimes it would really flood if uh, you know, there was lots of rain and so forth. But they're, they're camped across from Jericho. And after giving these three sermons, of course, Moses climbs up to the Pisgah at the top there, Nebo, and, and, uh, and dies. And is resurrected by God and so forth. So that's the sequence. They're just ready for Joshua to take over and cross the Jordan. Well, what's exciting about the story now under Nehemiah is that perhaps a majority of the Jews that had come back, the returnees, came together and were excited to hear the reading of God's word. We need to remember that when it talks about reading from the law, it is speaking about the Torah, the five books of Moses. It is most likely that he read from the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy foretells through uh, Moses' three final sermons to the children of Israel that what would happen if they did not follow God's guidance. Listen to Ezra, listening to Ezra, the people who had gathered in the square in Jerusalem realized how many of those terrible prophecies from the days of Moses 1,000 years earlier had, actually, had already taken place. I mean, imagine if you knew, you thought about your history and you know what you, you had just come through and now you read, it's all predicted in advance. Boom, 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 like that. Why do you suppose the people came at that point in time anxious to hear about the word of God? Did many of them know about Ezra's work? Were there rumors going around about what Ezra had discovered in the books of Moses? Probably. So now we come to the next four or five verses and I will scan through those for you. Ezra was standing on a wooden platform that had been built for the occasion. The following man stood at his right, and there are 13 names. I'm not going to bother to read them. As Ezra stood there on the platform high above the people, they all kept their eyes fixed on him. As soon as he opened the book, and now how, what would that consist of, opening the book? The Torah scroll. scroll. And they were probably large and fairly heavy scrolls. They all stood up. Ezra said, Praise the Lord, the great God. All the people raised their arms in the air and answered, Amen, Amen. They knelt in worship with their faces to the ground. Then they rose and stood in their places, and the following Levites explained the law to them and 13 more names. They gave an oral translation of God's law and explained it so that the people could understand it. Wow. Okay. So platform was built, first of all, so enough elevation above everybody else so that people all the way to the back would be able to see them. And Ezra's assistants could stand up high enough for everyone to see them. Thirteen men stood uh, with Ezra during the reading. Maybe they were responsible for holding the rolls, the scrolls that Ezra read, or perhaps some of them did a portion of the reading. Another thirteen men translated and explained the passage. Remember that with the Babylonian captivity, Aramaic had become the native language of the Jewish people. They were forced to speak that language in Babylon. While Hebrew and Aramaic are closely related, they are not the same. So very few people could immediately understand the Hebrew as it was read. Thus it was that God arranged with the help of Ezra for the, for the scriptures to be translated and explained in Aramaic. That would qualify as the first modern language translation. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Nehemiah 8. Nehemiah 8.8, 8, they gave an oral translation of God's law and explained it so that the people could understand it. That's from the Good News Bible. Wow. So what do we say about modern language translations? 
Well, they're approved of God as they cause rejoicing in heaven if they are done according to God's will. So what was the important point here in this few verses? The people understood what God had to say. Yeah. That's what really counts. God wants us to understand his word in a language that is familiar to us. And it's amazing how many different languages there are. In Tanzania, where I lived for a number of years, there were 120 languages in one country. Yeah. Kenya, there were 70 languages. Now, these are not, you know, they're, they're probably 10 or 15 that are sort of closely related, but not exactly the same. Hmm. And there's, there's still, Carrie knows about uh, efforts now being made to translate the Bible into uh, languages that are familiar in the, in the Middle East. There are some languages, fairly major languages in the Middle East that still don't have a Bible never and never have had a Bible in their language. Hmm. Amazing. Well, so how many languages do we have in the U.S.? <laughs> Southern, yeah. New, Eng New England, uh, Maine, well, Texas. This is, there's more differences than that uh, between these languages. But yeah, I mean, that's a question. Okay, so do we like to read the Bible in a language that we can understand? Sure. We do. Gordon? So first is from Joshua 1.8 from the Good News Bible. So he, once again, Joshua is back when? With Moses, a thousand, a thousand years before. Go ahead. Be sure that the book of the law is always read in your worship. Study it day and night and make sure that you obey everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful. Interesting he's saying that when they don't really have copies of Scripture for the average household. That's right. So so they're supposed to memorize it and repeat it back to each other and uh, say, what does that mean? Yep. So then continuing, this is in from Deuteronomy 17, eight, verse 18 and 19. It's predictions for a future king of uh, for Israel. When he becomes king, he is to have a copy of the book of God's law and teachings made from the original kept, original copy kept by the Levitical priests. He is to keep this book near him and read from it all his life so that he will learn to honor the Lord and to obey faithfully everything that is commanded in it. Wow. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a moment again. How many of the kings of either Israel or Judah do you think actually did that? Maybe one or two. Yeah, not many. Just imagine what a difference it would have been. It would have been if they had really done that. And that raises the question which is probably unanswerable, but raises the question that we should, every time we read another story in the Old Testament, we should, it should come up in our minds. Why were the people so inclined to follow the king? If there was a good king, they would actually improve somewhat. But bad kings, and you could just, again and again, the Bible says, you know, the bad king comes along and the whole nation follows. Just, okay, well, we can read the same thing basically from the New Testament. Yeah, jumping to John five thirty nine and 40. You study the scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And these very scriptures speak about me. Yet you are not willing to come to me in order to have life. The words of Jesus. Yes. And let's talk about that for just a moment. It's very likely that bright young scholars like Paul in his day, was Saul, he would have been Saul when he was still a scholar, probably memorized the entire Old Testament in the original languages. Probably. That was a common practice in those days if you wanted to be a real scholar of the scriptures. Mm. Try to imagine that. The whole thing. The whole thing. Oh my. Now, I, I when I heard that the first hard few to times... Believe. I, yeah, it was hard to believe. Really hard. And then I heard from a young man who went to a, an Adventist gentleman who went to a Jewish uh, seminary to take a few classes just to see what it was like and he decided to take a class on Isaiah 
and almost everyone in the class had Isaiah memorized in the original language in mm -hmm. our day. Oh, wow. So, and, and of course, they knew the Hebrew, too. Well, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm talking about. They, they had it memorized no, in I Hebrew. I mean, they knew what it meant. Oh, yeah, they understood, yeah, what it, what it meant, yeah. So, when Ezra and the priest called the people together, priests, pearl, to listen to the reading of the word, it is important to notice that they called together those who were able to understand. This is a clear indication of the purpose of the reading. And I don't know what arrangements they made for the young kids, but obviously, what's the intention here? God wants the women not to be distracted. He wants the women to be able to listen and understand along with the men and the, ki the, the kids who are old enough to understand. That's amazing. There are many passages of Scripture that encourage us to read and understand the Word of God, and I don't need to even talk about that, but Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 6, Joshua 1, Psalms 1, Proverbs 19, Ezekiel 37, Matthew 17 just as a starter. Well, can you think of a New Testament story that's a little bit like this in some respects? The story of Philip, Philip and the Philip Ethiopian, eunuch. Ethiopian eunuch. What happened? In that story, just briefly? Philip helped the eunuch to understand what, what he was reading. Now, there's a lot of interesting things about that story. First of all, why was this eunuch, why had he become a Jew, basically? Why had he become a believer in the true God? Ethiopia is a long ways from Judah, from Jerusalem. How did he even hear about it? I mean, I'd like to know those. Someday we'll hopefully find out. But you know that as a result of that, even uh, Emperor Haile Selassie of a number of years ago claimed to have been a descendant of Solomon. Well, Solomon, yeah, because of the time the woman from Queen of Sheba, Queen Queen of Sheba, Sheba. came up there and so forth. But there, to, even to this day, there are major groups in northern Ethiopia that basically practice what's roughly equivalent to the Jewish religion. And you probably remember, some of you, I remember, some years ago there was a time when they were being severely persecuted because of communism in Ethiopia. And a large contingent of them were welcome to, to move to Israel. Israel. Yeah. Yeah. So well, they call them falashas or something of that nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even ha even have an area where they have it locked up and they say it's the ark. Nobody yeah. Yeah. gets in to see what they've got. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another example when miraculous things happened to to get that done. So someone Mirac several major miracles happened to get one person down there to explain them to that, that other one person. Just two people involved. Well, Protestants are known for their belief that individual believers are the ones who will one day be saved. But this does not exclude the possibility that someone else could help us to understand what we are reading. So now... Maybe studying the Bible book by book would help that? What a revolutionary thought. Hmm. Maybe we should start that. Yes. What difference would it make in the lives of Seventh-day Adventists today if they really had an earnest desire to read and understand all the implications of God's Word? Ellen White says that w there should be times when the church service consists of someone who could do a good job standing up and reading from the Bible nonstop for the whole service. Mm, where is that at? I That's was afraid you would ask me that. Uh, it's there. Well, I'll see if I can find it. I remember yeah. reading that. Yeah. And of course, we here, with our Adventist background, would say an understanding of the Scripture, real understanding of the Scripture, must include an understanding of the great controversy over God's character and government, which is a key to understanding many difficult passages in Scripture. Yeah. And that makes a huge difference in how you relate to the rest of scripture so we now come to the next two verses Nehemiah 8 5 and 6 as Ezra stood there on the platform high above the people they all kept their eyes fixed on him as soon as he opened the book they all stood up Ezra said praise the Lord the great God all the people raised their arms in the air and answered amen amen, amen. they knelt to worship 
with their faces to the ground, and we had read that already. Um, so how large was this group that was listening to Ezra reading on the platform and the we, 13 people translating? We know that roughly 60,000 people had come back, some of them a number of years, some of them, what, 80, 70, 80 years before this. So had they doubled in their population in 70 or 80 years? We just don't know. Could have been up to 100,000 people. They must have how had a they real good megaphone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I can... I hear. Now, good question. They didn't have airplanes flying over. They didn't have other things making a lot of noise. They must that have had a strong good. voice. Well, I can tell you that reading. in our gen, well, almost in our generation, there are times when Ellen White spoke to group, groups of over 5,000 people and everyone could hear her. Now, whether that was a miracle... Well, you can't maybe count the way that the, the way the... Uh, Amphitheater is located? Yeah. Uh, for instance, when you're walking along on Beaumont yeah. here, and there's somebody up there where the power lines are on the top, uh, talking on a telephone, you can hear every word yeah. down below. And you fall. Right. You you may have been in the Capitol, in Washington D.C. There's a couple of places you can stand. Far, it's what whisper. 150 feet apart or something like this, and just whisper. And because of the acoustics, you can hear perfectly. Yeah. Maybe that was the gift of ears also that they no, had. Yes. Well, next we go to Nehemiah 8, 9 through 12. Yes. When the people heard what the law required, they were so moved that they began to cry. So Nehemiah, who was governor, and Ezra, the priest, and the scholar of the law, and the Levites who were explaining the law, told all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. So you're not to mourn and cry. Go home and have a feast. Share your food and wine with those who haven't enough. Today is holy to your Lord, so don't be sad. The joy that the Lord gives you will make you strong. Wow. Well, that's a great promise. Yes. The joy will make you strong. Yeah. Phenomenal. The Levites went about calming the people and telling them not to be sad on such a holy day. So all the people went home and ate and drank joyfully and shared what they had with others because they understood what had been read to them. Goodness, Bible. Deuteronomy 14, probably. Probably Deuteronomy 14. Well, one of the possible, one of the passages. Don't you wish you could have been? Imagine the the discussions that must have taken place around the dinner tables that day in, in, in Jerusalem and in the surrounding territory. Wow. Jim? So in later years, when the law of God was read in Jerusalem to the captives returned from Babylon, and the people wept because of their transgressions, the gracious words were spoken. Mourn not, go your way, eat the fat, and drink of the sweet, and send portions unto them, for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto your Lord, Neither be sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 8, 9 and 10. There's and that joy of the Lord bringing strength. Ministry of like time. Yeah. Well, you got, uh, uh, Jesus says, I came that you can have joy. I think there's in uh, 14, John 14, 15, 17, so, 16. So now think about it. If you had just recently returned from the experience of living as a slave in a foreign land, how would you have felt about reading the history of the Jewish people for the first time? Just think about what we know about the history of the Jewish people. Do you, you know, think it was the first time? Well, for some it probably was. They probably heard stories. but They, they, they had certainly they heard down. some of the major stories, yeah. I'm sure that's true. Yes. But reading the details must have had an enormous impact on them. They began to weep. Remember that they had just completed building the wall. Now on this special day known as the Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah, you might hear once sometimes they will announce on TV this is Rosh Hashanah for the Jewish population. They were supposed to begin preparation of their hearts for the Day of Atonement to come 10 days later. That of course required significant preparations because what happens on the Day of Atonement? Well, they fast, for one thing. Okay, and what happens at the temple? Sacrifice. That's, that's, a, that's the day of... The, 
Yeah, the Day of Atonement is the day when the, when the, the, the all about Leviticus 16, that the, the high priest goes into the most holy place and all that elaborate ceremony. So you got to be prepared for that. Sanctuary is cleansed. Sorry? Sanctuary is cleansed. Yes, yeah. Um, but that was not the whole story. An enormous revival had taken place among the people. With God's help, they had rebuilt the wall. Surely it was a time to rejoice in the Lord. So, what about us? Do we have reasons to rejoice in the Lord in our day? Yes. We should have more reasons to rejoice in the Lord than they do. I mean, we have the story of Jesus behind us. I think we should do that every morning and yeah. all through the day when you think about it. Absolutely. Well, so, so the, next, the next few verses. Nehemiah, starting with verse 13. The next day, the heads of the clans together with the priests and the Levites, went to Ezra to study the teachings of the law. They discovered that the law which the Lord gave to Moses ordered the people to, of Israel to live in temporary shelters during the festival of shelters. So, th so this implies that they didn't have a full knowledge of a lot of stuff because this, this is like, this is surprising to them. So they gave the following instructions and sent them all through Jerusalem and the other cities and towns. Go out to the hills and get branches from pines, olives, myrtles, palms, and other trees to make shelters according to the instructions written in the law. Now I'm going to stop there for a second and ask you a question. Have you ever seen a picture of the children of Israel camped at the foot of Mount Sinai? Drawings. Think so. Drawings. Well, sort of. What do you see? Tents. Yeah, tents. You see U.S. Army tents in a neat row yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lined up there. There's no trees. Look at they're They're living in homemade kind of shelters that are probably put together from branches of trees or something. I wonder what some, except if somebody's ever going <laughs> to try to make some kind of a correct representation. Probably some of them had skins that they used to, to make tents as well. There yeah, probably weren't a lot tent. of trees. Out no, the not desert. out there. No. 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 So the people got branches and built shelters on the flat roofs of the houses in their yards in the temple courtyard and in the public squares by the water gate and by the Ephraim gate. All the people who had come back from captivity built shelters and lived in them. This was the first time it had been done since the days of Joshua, son of Nun, and everybody was excited and happy. I bet the kids especially. Yeah. They're just camping out in your own front exactly. yard. Exactly. <laughs> From the first day of the festival to the last, they read a part of God's law every day. They celebrated for seven days, and on the eighth day there was a closing ceremony as required by the law. Wow. From the reading, they realized that they were supposed to be celebrating these three important festivals. For the first time since the days of Joshua the son of Nun, they gathered branches from various trees to form small enclosures in which they could live for one week, reminding them of the exodus from Egypt. I hope they didn't decimate all the trees around Jerusalem. That was my thought. Yeah. It's there, are, At least now there aren't that many trees. Yes. And that may have greatly decreased the population of trees. They came together to hear Ezra read from the scriptures every day for the next week. And so now we have the verses 39 to 43. When you have harvested your fields, celebrate this festival for seven days, beginning on the 15th day of the seventh month. The first day should be a special day of rest. On that day, take some of the best fruit from your trees. Take palm branches and the branches of leafy trees and begin a religious festival to honor the Lord your God. Celebrate it for seven days. This regulation is to be kept by your descendants for all time to come. All the people of Israel shall live in shelters for seven days so that your descendants may know that the Lord made the people of Israel live in simple shelters when he led them out of Egypt. He is the Lord your God. So that was the idea. So these verses explains what where they were supposed to do. We read about that. Try to imagine what it would have been like to be a part of that original camp meeting. Seventh-day Adventists used to hold camp meetings regularly in many different places. Some still do. It is now a custom that has fallen somewhat out of use. But surely if anyone has a reason to celebrate, we do. What God has promised us is beyond our wildest imaginations. Carrie? Isaiah 64, verse 4. 
It says, No one has ever seen or heard of a God like you who does such deeds for those who put their hope in him. 1 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 2, verse 9 states, However, as the scripture says, what no one ever saw or heard, what no one ever thought could happen, is the very thing God prepared for those who love him. And both references come from the Good News Bible. Wow. So, again, thinking about things that will happen in heaven now, as we experience something like what they were experiencing, what did the death of Jesus on the cross do about sin? Did it assuage the wrath of an angry God? What would that mean? That's, that's, what, that's a common belief among our Christian friends. The death of Jesus on the cross was for the benefit of the entire universe, most of whom had never sinned. What did the death of Jesus on the cross do for them? Well, Ephesians 1, 8 to 10 says, In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us a secret plan, the mystery in the Greek, he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan which God will complete when the time is right is to bring all creation. Who does that include? Everything in heaven. Everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. So that somehow or other we have to include the entire universe. Dennis, I think you're next. Ephesians 3, 7 to 10. I am less than the least of all God's people. Yet God gave me this privilege of ta talking to the Gentile, taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. Good News wow. Bible. Jackie. Colossians 1, 19 and 20, also from the Good News Bible. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things both on earth and in heaven wow so what did the death of Christ say to the entire onlooking universe through the plan of salvation a larger purpose is to be wrought out even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth this is from Ellen G. White, Signs of the Times, February 13, 1893. And a variety of other places. Yeah. Uh, if you listen to preaching from many Christian groups, the plan of salvation is all about how God saves me. And, and, and you too, of course, but especially me. And mostly based upon forgiveness. Yeah. Rather than changing one's thinking about God. Yeah. So I just need to get forgiven so the Lord won't be angry with me anymore and I can go to heaven because it's safe to live close to God like that. Ellen White in Patriarchs and Prophets has a marvelous quote about the plan of redemption. She says the plan of redemption had yet a broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, quote, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. John Can I interrupt 12. there for a second? Did anybody notice a problem with the quotation there? The King James says, I will draw all men unto me. So why doesn't have that here? Because men is in italics in 
the King James, not for emphasis, but because it's an added word. And what's Ellen White trying to say here? It's much more than men yes. on this yeah. earth it's and much women. Much more than hum men and it's women. the entire universe. Okay, so go ahead, Jim. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. Wow. Patriarchs and Prophets 68 and 69. So how do you suppose that happens? The, uh, Jesus said that the, the angels of the little ones do continually behold the face of the Father who is in heaven. There's something about beholding. Well, we have by beholding we become changed. Yeah. Uh, no man can see God and live. In our fallen condition, we can't. Uh, and but is so there a better quote anywhere about the plan of redemption and what it means? Not I only have, to us. I have is a whole there? handout, about ten pages of this. Yeah, this, this is just a really phenomenal summary. I think. Yeah, yeah it is. But it keeps the focus on on God. If there was yeah. any it's a greater wavering, yeah. there's there any sense of well, maybe I should look over here instead or or t inward, uh, this draws the attention back to God. Yeah. So what we're seeing here, very briefly, is you can look at the life and death of Jesus and you can study it and study it and study it, and we should, all of us, I think we should do it all the time. You can either live a life as far as possible like his. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to live completely like his for lots of reasons, but we can focus on living a life like him and we will live eternity, live for eternity, or we will die the death which he died. Jesus on the cross died the second death, the death which comes from separation from God. So in his life and his death, he demonstrated to the satisfaction initially of the entire universe because there was not a single human being who understood what was going on there at the point when Jesus died. But if you read Desire of Ages, he says, not only all the good angels and all the rest of the beings and the rest of the universe, but even Satan and his angels were watching that intensely and they realized that these questions had been answered by the life and death of Jesus. So it's an enormous, enormously Im important event for not just to have our sins forgiven, but to say something really important about the very nature of God and yes. the, the, yeah. uh, the whole plan of salvation. Well, remember, for the, remember that for the Christian, the ultimate reward will be where? In heaven. No matter what we have to go through on this earth, before we get to that point, we have a guaranteed future. So what is the joy of the Lord then? Our strength. Quoting okay. from Jesus in <laughs> Luke 15, 7 and 10. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent. In the same way, I tell you, the angels of God rejoice over one sinner who repents. And I'm going to comment there, too. Uh, obviously, God is excited. The universe is excited when people come back to God. That's the most important point here. But who are these 99 respectable people who do not need to repent? Are there yeah. any? I mean, who are those? <laughs> you said you? <laughs> no. Well, but we need That's to re remember this in context. Who was it that didn't think they needed to repent? Oh, those were the... Uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Yeah. They didn't think they needed to repent. Mm -mm. So he puts this in very nice words, but for the people who were living at that time, they knew who he was talking about. These people are the righteous ones. They're the, they're the saints. They don't need to repent. These are respectable people. They're the ones who sit up in front of the synagogue on Sabbath, and everybody says, wow, if I could just be like them. So what, what we're seeing here is a contrast between people who recognize their need and those who think they don't have any needs. Well, uh, Also, uh, uh, one of the... Well, the second fruit of the Spirit in, mm -hmm. in uh, uh, love, joy. Joy is the second one. And 
and all the uh, uh, he's the giver of all good gifts so uh, our joy comes from the Lord uh, yeah. and we should uh, the things that make bring him joy would then also uh, if we unless we resist his spirit would bring us joy yeah well think about this if one sinner who repents causes joy in heaven what do you suppose the response in heaven was when the entire group of returnees enthusiastically turned back to the Lord? Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about a celebration. That must have been enormous. Someday maybe we'll get to see that. The children of Israel had realized that they needed to repent and once again follow God. But that did not result in a long period of mourning. God's forgiveness was immediate and bountiful. In fact, God is forgiveness personified. He even forgave the men who are nailing him to the cross in Luke 23, 34. So, Myra, I think, are you next? Yes. Now, they must manifest faith in his promises. God had accepted their repentance. They were now to rejoice in the assurance of sins forgiven and their restoration to divine favor. Every true turning to the Lord brings abiding joy into the life. When the sinner yields to the influence of the Holy Spirit, he sees his own guilt and defilement in contrast with the holiness of the great searcher of hearts, Ellen G. White, Prophets and Kings. So that's just emphasizing what Dennis said a few moments ago. It's not just heaven that rejoices when we come back to God. If we really understand what's going on, we really understand, we develop a relationship with God, it brings joy to us. It makes us it possible for us to survive through the vicissitudes of, of life. And the, he sees his own guilt and defilement in contrast. So there's almost a sense where some would say um, that's depressing. Yeah. To see my own guilt and defilement. In fact, there some people don't want to change. But uh, I was just kind of thinking about that. And suppose uh, the Lord lifted you out of your chair and suddenly you realized that there was a poisonous snake sitting right next to you. Maybe it's in that sense that we see the awfulness of our sin. Mm -hmm. What could have happened to us if God hadn't been merciful to Very us? Very good point. I was running this morning. Actually, it was yesterday morning, I'm sorry. Down the hill next to my house, making fast speed as I could. And all of a sudden, there was a dead snake on the road. And I, it was one of those ones with the funny little black and yellow uh, circles around it. And I, King snake. Mm -hmm. No, it was... Maybe. I don't know. It wasn't very long and it was dead. But with studying God's word until we clearly develop a close relationship with God and understand the basic tenets of salvation bring rejoicing? Yes. Mm -hmm. It should, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It does every day. Mm -hmm. But does it seem like a contradiction of sorts that we are supposed to mourn for our sins and yet rejoice in the Lord? Is that... It doesn't that seem wrong? like we ought to dwell on our sins. Exactly. If we really understood God's loving grace, what that really means to us, we don't have to be obsessed with our sin. That's right. I, mean, In fact, I don't we want to live be. that way. We shouldn't be. Those are history. You can't yeah. change history. Right. It's, it's there. And foremost, as we've said, by beholding we become changed. So if we're dwelling on our sins, what's going to happen? We're going to be more sinful, right? That's the whole point. We so, can make that, use that awareness, though, to ask forgiveness uh, from other people who we've wronged because we, we yeah. become aware of just how terrible our behavior was. Well, it's very interesting to notice in Romans... Uh, well, I guess I think we have time to read this quickly. Now we know that everything... This is Romans 3, verses 19 to 24. Now we know that everything in the law applies to those who live under the law in order to stop all human excuses and bring the whole world under God's judgment. For no one is put right in God's sight by doing what the law requires. What the law does is to make people know that they have sinned. But now God's way of putting people right with himself has been revealed. Actually, it says literally God's righteousness has been revealed. It has nothing to do with law 
even though the law of Moses and the prophets gave their witness to it. God puts people right through their faith in Jesus Christ. God does this to all who believe in Christ because there is no difference at all. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. But by the free gift of God's grace, all are put right with him through Christ Jesus who sets them free. Amen. And what's amazing is what comes next. God offered him so that by his blood, that would be his sacrificial death, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven up front through their faith in him. So now what does it accomplish? God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. In the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins, but in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. And this way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. That's the 1888 message, message right there. Yep. And we fail sometimes to realize the wonderful load that's lifted when we recognize that. It's his righteousness, not ours. Yes, exactly. So, who would have ever questioned God's righteousness? Lucifer did. A Lucifer, of course. So if we understand, and, and many of our Christian friends, even the translations that are in my Bible here, as much as I like the Good News translation, almost every translation, there's no question about God's righteousness unless you understand the great controversy and the implications of the great controversy. You don't understand why, why is there any question about God's righteousness? But this is the only verse in the Bible where any Bible writer just specifically says, let's talk about why Jesus had to die. It's to demonstrate God's righteousness. Well, we have every... So which version translates that in an optimal way? Or is there one? Uh, I don't know that there is one. Uh, Goodspeed does a pretty good job. Um, and Jim, I think, you Romans three twenty five. Are you going to read it from a different version for us? Yeah, this is a, a base Bible in basic English. This is not none of them are really very good. Yeah. But uh, whom God put forth as a sign of His mercy through faith in His blood to make clear, in excuse me, make clear His righteousness when in His pity God let the sins of earlier times go without punishment. But this business of the good news translation that it did it so that you can be forgiven, it's it's purely made up on the yeah. part of the translator. Well, the, the, <clears throat> the fortunate thing is that it if you have this translation and most of the more traditional ones clearly talk about God's righteousness, and that's absolutely the, that's the you're key. absolutely right. And of course, and then you the words of Jesus in John what is John eighteen thirty seven he came to show. Yeah. It's good. What uh, the truth? Yeah. Bear witness to the truth. Well, we have every <clears throat> reason to celebrate. In the next three chapters, well, this chapter and two more, Nehemiah eight through ten. Read it in your favorite version. It's interesting to notice that Ezra is only mentioned twice in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah eight, nine, and then finally Nehemiah twelve twenty six. But in eight to ten, it is written from a third person perspective, and probably that's intentional. It probably intended for this piece that we have just been discussing to be used by the people again and again in their in their worship services in trying to understand God. And guess what? Words, two different Hebrew words talking about understanding are occur six one of them six times and the other one two times. So it's all it's all about understanding. So it's very important to recognize that most of all, God wants us not only to read his book, but also that we understand what we are reading and the implications of those words. Understanding the words led the people assembled on that special day to weep. How does the reading of God's word affect us? God is pleading with us to come back to him, to work with him and to finish the gospel so that the whole sin experience can come to an end. Time in reading God's word is intended to lead to personal and corporate revival. The leaders did everything they could to make the reading of God's word as meaningful as possible, and they suggested a corporate revival. A correct understanding of the great controversy and how God has won the great controversy is worth rejoicing about from the re for the rest of eternity. And, um, Carrie? 
Thank you. Yes. That which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. Fallen men could not have a home in the paradise of God without the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Shall we not then exalt the cross of Christ? The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed in even. Eden, rather, the paradise of bliss. It comes wow. from Signs of the Times in 1989. Wow, wow. wow. So what are we 18, saying? Hmm? 1889. 1889, yeah. What we're saying here is that the angels watched, basically they watched what Satan accomplished by bringing death of Christ uh, uh, to, to place. And the way he, 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 he motivated the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees to kill Jesus. And for the first time, she implies, they really had a deeper understanding of the impact of sin on people. That, that Satan could be responsible for killing Jesus. They were just completely blown away by it. Well, do we think about everything, about, think about that every time we, uh, that relationship every time when we think about this thing, I'm sorry, to God in our future home? A, a gentleman, a Holocaust survivor wrote these words, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. It was God's original purpose for the children of Israel to represent Him correctly before the surrounding nations. This, this story of the rebuilding of the wall and the reading of God's Word in a language that people could understand is one occasion when that actually happened. How has an understanding of the deeper meanings of Scripture impacted your life? Think about it. What difference does it make to you to really read a story from the Bible and really understand its implications? Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow before you recognizing your presence, but most of all recognizing what a wonderful plan you have for our lives. These people, many, many hundreds of years ago, began to get a taste of that as they rejoiced there from hearing the words read and understanding what, what it was about. May that be our experience as each time we read Scripture is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.